I'm happy to be here. Um, and I will discuss today a new paper that I wrote with uh, Jean Grossman. It's a theoretical exploration of the impact of identity politics on the formation of trade policy. And it is uh, what we hope to be the beginning of a research line that's trying to integrate identity politics into economic analysis. And I'll illustrate it today with an application to trade policy. So what is the motivating question? Why the sudden shift to economic nationalism and anti-trade and anti-immigration, both in the US and Europe, and it's quite widespread in, in European countries? So we, what we do in this paper is we propose to link this shift in social identity uh, to the changing place, landscape uh, of politics. So this means that in order to do it, we have to bring into the economic analysis uh, both political considerations and uh, social psychological considerations. And so this is the task. We develop this framework which hopefully can be used in other applications uh, as well. So the idea is to introduce identity politics into this type of analytical framework, and I'll say a little bit more about what we mean by identity politics. Although I'm sure you read a lot about it in the newspapers, uh, it's quite possible that different people have somewhat different views of uh, what, it, uh, uh, what it means. So the emphasis that we are going to make in this analytical framework is uh, shifts in what's known in social psychology as self-categorization. And self-categorization can be triggered by a variety of either political or, uh, or economic uh, changes. And we will particularly be interested in populism uh, but in a particular form of populism, which is relevant uh, for trade policy. So what is social identity? It's an element of an individual's self-concept. This is what social psychologists teach us. The drive perceived membership in different groups. So people choose uh, to identify with particular groups. The founder of this literature uh, is Teifel, and Turner, uh, who was his student, continues this line of research uh, in various directions. And the, the idea there is that people have a sense of who they are uh, by associating, associating themselves with particular groups. Now, these groups can be class, classes or family, uh, can be religious groups or ethnic groups uh, and the like. And the point is that by identifying with a group, a person derives satisfaction and pride from whatever uh, success the group achieves. And what's important here is that the self-image is enhanced of a person by the status of the group in society. And there can be different elements that affect status. Uh, but we will uh, focus on an economic element which we think is uh, quite important. So the point is that people imagine themselves belonging to these groups. And what is important is that the self-categorization theory that Turner actually developed uh, emphasizes the fact that people choose with which groups to identify and they don't need anybody's permission to identify with this group. It's a, a sort of self-driven uh, identification process. Okay, so as I said, uh, people choose uh, to identify with groups and they don't need permission of anyone to identify. It's a sort of self-image. And of course, there is no coercion. Now, uh, 
social identity theory was introduced into economics um, about 18 years ago by Akerlof and Crampton. And what their uh, mission at the time was to try to analyze how people change their behavior once they identify with certain groups. And uh, this is somewhat different from uh, the way we think about it. So our uh, paper is closest in spirit, not in form uh, or detail, to a paper that was uh, published by Moses Shio in the American Political Science Review in 2009. And what he did was he defined a social identity equilibrium in which individual behaviors are consistent with social identity and social identities are consistent with the economic and social environment essentially. And then the social environment is determined by individual behavior. So it's a sort of social uh, equilibrium. He used a very simple framework to describe how it works. What we do in terms of the use of political science is we rely on uh, models of electoral competition that have been developed a long time ago. Uh, I'll describe a little bit more uh, these uh, models in, uh, without much detail. And the key thing there is that if you want to apply it to a policy environment, you should think about pliable policies that parties or politicians can change and other characteristics of politicians of political parties that are unalterable. And the political, uh, uh, the political competition is about these pliable policies. So this is the approach uh, we take here. The typical thing there is that in the design of pliable policies, the politicians consider the welfare of the voters. And they try to attract as many voters as they can using these pliable policies. Our modification is that instead of using as welfare measure the sort of standard materialistic welfare that we use in economic, we use the broader welfare measures that factor in the welfare that individuals derive from identifying with various groups in a society. For robustness, we also do an anal analysis with the median voter, which I usually don't like particularly, but in any case, this is to satisfy some individuals in the profession. <laughs> so the, uh, the individuals in our framework, they differ by socioeconomic class uh, and by ethnicity. And they can choose to whether identify with their socioeconomic class, they can choose whether to identify with their ethnic class, and they can choose whether to identify with what we call the broad nation. And this is sort of important that they have the choice to identify with the broad nation or not. Like in the US, uh, people insist of being American, and sometimes they redefine what um, being an American means. And so this is the sort of categorization that we will use in the analysis. OK, so let me jump quickly to the economic uh, uh, environment. So we begin with a simple structure. I'll focus most of my discussion on the simple structure. and the end, I'll tell you what happens in the broader structure without going into too much details. So think about uh, an economy that has uh, individuals with two skill levels. And for now, no ethnic divisions. And I'll tell you later what happens when there are ethnic divisions as well. So when we do the extension, we introduce three skill levels rather than two in order to be able to say something also about the impact of this type of identification on polarization in society. Uh, and we introduce a majority-minority division, which is uh, essentially ethnic. The economic structure is going to be extremely simple. It will be a very standard and this is by choice so that we don't confuse people and focus on the other issues. So it's a very simple actual lean structure. Uh, there are two goods. Z is an import competing product and X is an export product. The two factors will be H uh, meaning skilled workers and L meaning unskilled workers. And we normalize the population to equal one. 
and will denote by lambda h the fraction of skilled workers in the population by lambda l the fraction of the unskilled. And we are going to assume that the import competing product is intensive in low skilled workers. So think about a country which is uh, sort of more developed essentially like, like the US. The preferences will be quasi-linear to get rid of income effects which add uh, many expressions to the analytics but don't really buy much uh, traction. So uh, there is constant marginal utility of the export good and there is a concave preference over the import competing good. And what is important here, there are two psychological components of utility. So as I mentioned earlier, it's pride from uh, group membership, and this is from the identification, and this pride be, uh, depends on the status of the group. And we are going to identify status with average income of members of the group. So higher income means higher status here. The other is a dissonance cost of membership. And this has to do with the question how different am I from members of a group with which I identify. If I'm different, I suffer a dissonance psychological cost. And the typical thing is uh, what they call in social psychology, uh, I look at my distance from the group in conceptual space. And you can think about, generally speaking, that there are characteristics of the group in some Euclidean space, and I look how far I am from the average uh, group member in this space. And my cost of identifying with the group will be higher the more different I am from the representative member of the group. Okay, so what, are, what about the politics? So as I said, we are using electoral competition, although it's mostly in the background because we use one major result from this literature in order to define the objective function of the policy maker. So think about two political parties. As I said before, they are distinguished by their platforms. Uh, and the platform has some pliable elements and some non-pliable elements. They cannot change the fixed elements, obviously, but they propose trade policies instrumentally in order to affect voting, and meaning each one tries to attract as many voters as they can. Now, critically, voters are heterogeneous in their ideological views, and they vote for the preferred, preferred party based on these views and on the pliable policies of the parties. So what's known from this literature is that if the distribution of these ideological preferences is, is the same essentially within different groups, then this leads to convergence of policy platforms, the pliable policies that maximize essentially average welfare or aggregate welfare. If the distributions are different, then this leads to convergence in the policy choice that maximizes a weighted average of these welfare levels. So we are going to use the simpler formulation and look at uh, aggregate or average uh, welfare. The new thing here is that welfare now includes the materialistic welfare from the utility function that I showed you before that depends on the consumption of the export uh, good and the import competing good, as well as from uh, identification. And we are looking for a social equilibrium. So, uh, as I mentioned before, we think about three identity groups. We take these identity groups as exogenous at this point. Maybe in a future paper, we'll try to endogenize this. It's a very hard task to endogenize. So we think about working class group and elite and a broad identification with the nation, which uh, like Americans or Uruguayans, yes, in, the, in this case. So who identifies as working class? I will cut short this discussion. Essentially, uh, the low-skilled workers identify as working class because they are all assumed to be identical. 
there is no dissonance because no, every worker is the same like every other, way, other worker in this group. So obviously they choose to identify with the group because there's, there are some status gains, there are no losses from uh, uh, identification. What about the elite is the same. They always identify with the elite uh, because there are no costs involved, but there are gains in status. We make just assumptions to secure that no elite member wants, wants to identify with the working class or vice versa. So there's no cross-identification in, in this sense. So for now, before I introduce ethnic diversity, the, all the action is whether people identify broadly with the nation. Does everyone in Uruguay identify as an Uruguayan? Okay, so this is the issue. Does every Hungarian identify as a Hungarian or every Pole identifies as a Pole? And the key, one key uh, result will be what happens when people choose to narrow down their definition of national identity. Okay, so the way we think about it is you compare your status benefits from identifying with the nation, which depends on average income in the country. But if you identify with the nation, then you are obviously different from the average. If there are skilled and unskilled workers, and there's only one dimension here of heterogeneity, then you look how different you are from the average Uruguayan in terms of income. And later, in terms of uh, ethnic class as well. So we'll use this indicator variable uh, to indicate uh, if this is equal to one, then the highly skilled workers identify with the nation. If it's zero, they don't. And the same for the uh, less skilled workers. So this is just a uh, notation. Okay, so what happens now is that the price of the export good will be normalized to one, and we won't bother about it. And the import good will have a foreign price Q. So Q represents the terms of trade here, essentially. And there is a potential tariff T. So the domestic price is P. And you, we can conduct most of the analysis in terms of a policy choice that determines P uh, rather than T. So the material well-being of an individual from working class I is the individual's wage. There is some transfer from the government, which in this case will be essentially the tariff revenue. And there is the consumer surplus from the consumption of the import competing good. Okay, so this is a sort of a standard uh, representation here. So the new thing here is this. This is the one thing you have to carefully follow what I say. The only equation that you have to carefully follow. So utility of, say, a skilled worker from identification. So there can be some constant if the individual identifies with the elite. Then VH here is the utility, average utility of an elite member, which is a high-skilled worker. It depends on the domestic price of the good and Q. And the, this is essentially an indirect utility function of the materialistic utility function that I showed you before. And there is a parameter alpha which says, how important do I consider the status of the group with which I identify? So this is for the elite. Now, all of this is if an elite member identifies with the nation. So we have this indicator variable which equals one if she does, zero otherwise. And here we have again some constant. We have something proportional to the average uh, real income of the elite members. And this is the element of cost. So there is some parameter beta should be, uh, which tells you how sensitive I am to these costs. What is driving these costs? How different I am from the average member of the group. So I look at my material well-being versus the average of the group. 
okay? And it's squared here, so that we get, get some convexity. So this is the status gain, and this is the cost uh, by being different from other group members. Okay, so, okay, so this is the sort of key. And there's a similar formulation for the uh, low-skilled individuals. So all in all, you get a sort of long expression for the utility function, uh, which the politicians try to maximize. This is this capital U, but the details of this are not important for my presentation. I'll tell you what the results are, and you will believe me that we have derived them properly. Yes. Okay, so the sort of key is that the competition for votes leads to a choice of a, a domestic price P that maximizes this aggregate uh, utility function. And what's important here is the, is the following. Think about um, like a multi-stage game. So in the first stage, the politi politicians choose their policies. In the second stage, every individual looks at the policy offered by a political party and using this policy, she calculates whether to identify with the nation or not. And given whether she identifies or not, she gets some utility, which is the combination of the material well-being plus the utility from identification. She makes the same comparison with the other party, and whichever comes ahead, she votes for them. Okay? So the, the key here is that the politicians move first. They choose their platforms. And in the second stage, the voters evaluate these platforms and they vote. And we look, we look for a subgame perfect equilibrium of this two-stage game. So from the political, politician's point of view, uh, a simple way to describe this is like this. Think about uh, these preferences for given identification patterns. So if nobody identifies with the nation, you get this curve R0. If only the working class identifies with the nation, you get, an, you get another curve like this. If only the elite identifies with the nation, you get this one. And if both, everybody identifies with the nation, you get a still other uh, curve like this. So for each identification pattern, you get a curve that has a maximum. Now what the politicians want to do is, they want to choose a policy that is the maximum maximorum across this identification pattern. And the only thing that you have to ascertain is that when they choose it, that this is consistent with the desire of individuals to identify in this case. So it's like a participation constraint. But it turns out that in this case, this participation constraint is automatically satisfied. So in this picture, what you see is that the maximizing policy is the policy uh, where everybody identifies with the nation. This is the highest point. So in this case, this will be the equilibrium outcome. The politicians will choose this policy, and everybody will identify with the nation. There will be broad identification. Does this have to be the case? No, it does not have to be the case. It's possible that one of the other identification pattern is the one that maximizes. But this is just an illustration of one possibility. Does it have to be that the order of these peaks is like here? No, it doesn't. Uh, but there are limits on how they can switch around. So all of these are details in which you are not interested now, I'm sure, uh, in this short presentation. Okay, so the one obvious thing is the following. If nobody identifies with uh, the broad nation, then essentially what the politicians will do is they will maximize uh, material welfare. And maximizing material welfare leads to free trade. 
And we have chosen the structure in this way so that we have a benchmark with which uh, everybody is essentially familiar. Okay, now, when there are individuals who identify with the broad nations, then what happens is on the cost side of identifying with the nation, there is the inequality in wages. And the higher this inequality, the higher these costs. So what happens in this framework is that there appears to be concern, concern to inequality, but the concern to inequality does not arise because individuals really care about inequality. It arises because they care about their cost of identifying with the nation. If they don't identify with the nation, they don't care about this cost, and we have free trade. But if they do identify with the nation, then they care, care about inequality. And then what happens is within this range of policies, the politicians care about inequality because they care about votes. And this, therefore, leads to positive protection. OK, so this is the first proposition. If there, is, there are costs, so these are measures which tell us about the cost of identifying with the nation, how sensitive we are to these costs, to these distances uh, in income. So if these are positive, then if nobody identifies with the nation, there is free trade. And if either one of the groups does identify with the nation, this leads to pro positive protection. And in the graph that I showed you, this, show, this leads to positive protection with full identification. But it doesn't matter whether there's full identification or only one of the groups identify. It still leads to uh, protection. Then we go through a set of uh, comparative statics ex exercises. Uh, so the marginal uh, utility from a from a domestic price P, which is proportional to the marginal utility from a tariff, yes, can be decomposed into a component which depends, this is the import function, so this is a negative component. When you raise the price and there is positive protection, this reduces welfare, so this is a cost of the policy. But you can, may have a benefit which depends, delta is the difference in wages between the skilled and unskilled workers. And the slope of this wage differential is negative due to the Stolper-Samuelson theorem, essentially. So what happens is when you reduce inequality, this is beneficial. So the trade-off is between the cost, which is essentially the Harberger triangles under the import demand function, and the benefit of reducing the cost of identification. If, there is, if people identify, namely if these indicators happen to be one. Then you can compute the response of a, the uh, equilibrium policy to some parameter changes. And once you have it, uh, you can do all sorts of uh, comparative static uh, exercises. So one sort of interesting comparative static exercise is to ask the following question. What happens when there is a shift in the, in the cost of identification? Namely, I become more and more sensitive to the fact that my income differs from the average income of the population. So the, this is the result. It says if, if some group in society becomes more sensitive to these psycho cost, then what's going to do happen is this will raise the rate of protection. So the rate of protection is predicted here to be higher in societies in which there is more sensitivity to this cost of identification with the nation. Okay? And essentially, you can go back to the previous equation and see how it affects the marginal benefit and the marginal cost. Generally speaking, uh, you cannot sign this thing, but if you, look, if you use the equilibrium conditions, then the, this yields a sort of clear result. Okay, then we look at a variety of other things. Uh, for example, we look at technical progress. 
and we show that Higgs neutral technical progress in this economy will lead to more protection. Skill bias technical pro progress will also lead to more protection under a, ver a variety of circumstances. I'm not going to uh, go over these details. Uh, the other thing we look at is how does an economy respond in terms of its equilibrium policy uh, to shifts in the terms of trade. So for example, improvements in the terms of trade that expand uh, the trade volume of this uh, economy, how does this play out? So one sort of intuitive result is that it leads if the terms of trade improve so that the import price falls, it also leads to a fall in the domestic price. Uh, so there is at least some pass-through from foreign prices to domestic prices. The policy distortion uh, does not shift, uh, eliminate this type of uh, pass-through. And then uh, whether you want a higher or lower rate of protection, in terms of percentages, say, uh, this is more complicated. We have a set of necessary and sufficient conditions uh, under which uh, this happens. So I'm going to skip this, all the details of this too. So one of the more interesting things, uh, which is why we got all excited about this approach, uh, is to consider what we call a populist uh, revolution. I mean, this, is, this term is a little bit too fancy for what we do, but uh, I'll explain to you exactly what we mean by this term. Okay, so what, what is populism, generally speaking? If you read the political science literature, uh, like uh, Fukuyama, or actually this book by uh, Jan Werner Muller is probably the best book uh, on populism. He's a political scientist uh, at Princeton. Uh, then generally speaking, the way political scientists think about popular, populist shifts is uh, people sort of discount the elite and they make a moral claim to representation of a narrower set of individuals in society essentially. And uh, what uh, uh, Muller says is Populists do not just criticize elites, they also claim that they and only they represent the true people. This is definitely true in the US, in Hungary, in Poland, and uh, in, in, in several other countries. So the way we think about it is that populism is a particular form of identity <laughs> politics. And populists classify elites as them so they don't include them in their definition of broad identification. And they separate the elite, which are them, from us. And they seek to justify the name of these policies in name of the people who are defined in this particular way. And this is uh, uh, quite common. So the way we think about it is consider a shift in either the economic circumstances or in the political environment that induces the working class, in this case, to stop identifying broadly. So they reduce their identification from broad identification with the nation to a narrower identification. They mostly do it by redefining, by redefining what's the relevant pop, uh, population of the nation. So in Hungary, this doesn't include the immigrants, there are some trends in the U.S. not to include immigrants, yes, uh, and so on. So this is the sort of basic point. So the way I'm going to think about it is that for some reason, which we don't specify, politicians convince individuals that uh, they should place a higher weight on how different they are from the average representative of the nation. So I'm a working class member, and uh, Urban in Hungary convinces me that there is the elite. We shouldn't identify with the elite. If we identify with the nation which includes the elite, 
then my cost of identification is going to be high. So this is the sort of basic structure. So let's start from an equilibrium where everybody identifies broadly. Uh, so we are with the, uh, in this curve RHL that I showed you in the figure. And then there is this shift in cost that leads to a shift in identification. So we moved from this equilibrium pattern of identification to the new one where the working class don't identify it broadly anymore, but we just leave the elite to identify broadly. Okay, so going back to the figure that I had before, we start with the same equilibrium that we had, and now this shift, what it does, it reduces the benefit of identifying with the nation for the working class. But this shifts down this one. It also shifts down this curve, but uh, it's irrelevant here, so we didn't just want to clutter the figure. So these two curves shift down, essentially. Now, because this was the peak, the global peak, if it shifts down enough, one thing that happens is that the, the policy at which it peaks moves to the right. This was the result I showed you before. But now, if it shifts down enough, this becomes lower than this peak here. So when this becomes lower than this peak here, then what happens is that suddenly, this becomes the peak. And when this becomes the peak, there is a jump in the trade policy from a low level of protection to a high level of protection. So one way to think about it is you may have continuous shifts in trade policy when these uh, political costs rise. You get uh, increases in trade policy which are uh, continuous. And then there is a shift in identification regime at some point. It's like a critical point. And then you get a discontinuous jump, a big response in trade policy. So in this case, what you see is that there is a rise in protection. There's a surge, a huge surge in protection. Is this always the case? The answer is no. It's possible that this peak here will be to the right of this one. And if it is to the right, then there will be still a jump in trade policy, but it will be in the opposite direction, towards freer trade. So the question is, when can we expect a surge in protection in response to a populist, what we call a populist revolt, essentially. So the answer is the following. Uh, this is the necessary and sufficient conditions. I'm sure you remember all the notation and you can see exactly what's happening, but nevertheless, I'll, sum I'll summarize it for you. So what we show is that there is a critical uh, lambda H, namely the critical fraction <coughs> of the elite in the population, such that if the elite is smaller than this critical fraction, then there is an upward jump in protection. And if the elite is very big, then there might be a downward jump in protection in response to, uh, to this, uh, to this uh, jump in identification. So, so we, we did this uh, sort of to illustrate for some parameters like if the value of status is one tenth of the value of, of uh, my own utility. So think about a dollar, a dollar of status of some of the na or for the group versus a dollar that I get if I place a value of ten of ten cents on every dollar in the group as compared to myself, then. Uh, the elite is going, this cutoff is about 7.7% for the elite. So if the elite is less than 7.7%, there's going to be an upward jump in protection. Otherwise, there will be a, down, a downward jump. Okay, the, another sort of point we make is the following. In some of the sociology literature, there's an emphasis on the fact that 
if I, I also compare myself not only to what happens within the group, but also to out groups. So one way to think about it is take these workers, the low skill workers, who stop identifying with the broad nation, then in this case, once they do it, they become jealous of the elite. And this imposes an additional cost. If this mechanism or channel operates, then this sort of broadens the range of the lambdas in which there is an upward jump in protection. So in here, instead of 7.7%, it may go up to 10% or 12%, whatever the case may, may be. OK, so let me move on now to the sort of full extension. So in the, in the full-blown uh, full model, we have more cleavages, as I mentioned before, and therefore a wider menu of choices for individuals with whom to identify. Uh, so think about it in the following way. So there are now three groups of individuals. They are the highly skilled, they are the less skilled, L, but now we have really low skilled individual, K, and we are going to put these low skilled individuals to work in services. And the other two groups work in these manufacturing sectors. And services are not traded. This is how we build the model. You can build your own economic model, you know. But this is how we do it here. And there are two ethnic groups. We can call them majority, capital M, and minority, lowercase m. So you can think about uh, uh, whites and blacks, or uh, you can think about uh, Europeans and Asians, in, say, in the UK. So you can sort of choose uh, the division. The key is that there is a majority and, and a minority, and there are these three groups. So there are now three pro sectors. There's the exportable, the import competing, and there's the service sector. And we make this extreme assumption that all the K workers are employed in the service sector. So you have to work a little harder now in order to uh, work out the details. But it's not very complicated, actually. The key is you have to derive the wage of the service workers. And the wage of the service workers also depends on the trade policy. And how it depends on the trade policy depends on whether services are gross star substitutes or gross complements to the import competing product and consumption. Now, the typical way we write utility functions, there are gross complements. So this is how we are going to to model it. And what this does is that more protection affects negatively the wages of the service workers. So this is the sort of uh, key economic relationship. So what are now the identification patterns, potential identification patterns? So in, there are individuals now who are skilled, unskilled, or service workers, and can, they can be of one ethnicity or the other. So now, for example, if, you, if I identify with my class, so suppose I am a, low, a very low skilled worker in services, when I identify with my, uh, my class, K, what happens is that this class might include majority and minority individuals. So I don't have any more a distance in conceptual space as far as the income is concerned. But I do have one as far as ethnicity is concerned. So generally speaking, you have a two-dimensional Euclidean space. You are located somewhere there. The group that with which you try to identify is located somewhere else. And you look at the distance between the two. And you can wait. The, the characteristics differently. So some people may place a lot of weight on income, others may place a lot of weight on ethnic diversity. So th this is sort of, uh, provides some flexibility. So now every individual can identify with their class, 
Yes, they can identify with their ethnic group if they choose to, and they can again identify with the nation. When they identify with the nation, they identify with both blacks and whites, and with the elite, and the poor working people in services, and so on. So all of this has to be factored in and uh, properly computed. Uh, so you need some measure of uh, distance in ethnic space. It turns out that this is not so important, so we can normalize it, that the, say the elite is one and the others are zero. I mean, all of this makes no difference because you have some degree of free freedom given these parameters which measure the sensitivity of individuals to ethnic diversity. A higher beta E means that I am more sensitive to differences in ethnic composition. And this is the sort of only thing that you, 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 you want to remember, if you want to remember something, yes. <laughs> so think about uh, now the politics that encourage individuals to raise their sensitivity to ethnic diversity. So this means, for example, that people become more sensitive to the ethnic composition of white versus black or immigrants versus non-immigrants and, and things like this. What is it going to do? So this I, I affects the cost of identification with the social class, for example, and also with the nation. Okay, so the main result here is the following, that because the trade policy doesn't affect the distance in ethnic space, then if the sensitivity in ethnic space goes up, this essentially has no impact on the rate of protection as long as the pattern of identification doesn't change. So shifts in the sensitivities within the range in which there is no shift in identification essentially doesn't impact the trade policy. So, this, this, uh, so the interesting thing, of course, is what happens if we have uh, uh, what we call uh, this type of revolution where people stop identifying, some people stop identifying with the nation. And, and this is really what we are mostly interested in. So think about these increases in beta E, which measures the sensitivity of individuals to how different they are from others in ethnic space. And suppose that it rises enough until some groups stop identifying with the nation. What's going to be the response in, in trade policy? So what we show is summarized in this proposition. Uh, if the least skilled individuals who are employed in services are the ones who become more sensitive to this diversity in ethnic space, then this leads always to higher rates of protection independently on whether it happens among the majority least skilled or the minority least skilled. So either group, when it becomes more sensitive and stops identifying, this leads to higher protection. Intuitively, it has to do with the fact that uh, the trade policy basically affects them negatively, the way I've described it before. The, uh, and, and therefore, once they stop identifying, then the policy makers become less sensitive to their desires. This is sort of, roughly speaking, uh, what works out. For the middle class, <coughs> those who belong to skill level L, uh, things are more complicated. So if the middle uh, skilled workers of any ethnicity cease to identify with the nation, and if their wage is at least as great as the economy average, so they have a wage above, then this also leads to more protection. Again, it leads to a jump, an upward jump in protection. Now, this is a sufficient condition. It's not a necessary condition, so it can happen that the uh, rate of protection will increase even if their 
wage is somewhat below the average wage in the economy. Okay, so this is just a sufficient condition. Okay, so I sort of gave you some sense of how this social system operates and how it, the channels through which it can impact policy, and uh, here we dealt only with trade policy. So let me sort of uh, summarize. So the way we think about it is that voter preferences in behavior uh, depend on a variety of things and people don't always vote their narrow economic interests. For example, many of Trump's voters wouldn't have voted for them and wouldn't have said exposed that they would have voted against, uh, for him again if they were concerned only with narrow economic interests. Okay. Uh, and this is true uh, sort of more generally. So voters have concerns for others, but not all others. If you take a social identity approach, they factor in concerns for others in a particular way and for particular others and not necessarily for all the others. Uh, and social identity theory is sort of consistent with uh, uh, these type of uh, observations. Now, as you have seen, in order to build a model that accounts for electoral competition with social identity, you have to build in many details. And um, we are not wedded to every detail of this model, and if you want to do some work in this area, uh, you are welcome to use your variant, yes? And the problem is that if you look at the empirical literature in social psychology, it really is not enough to provide guidance to all these details. So there is some guidance which is broad, and this is what we utilize, but there are other details that uh, one can use probably in different ways. Uh, but we do think that uh, changes in identification uh, generate policy differences and therefore voting patterns and therefore they have effects uh, on policy formations. And we are sort of working on other issues like immigration, uh, growth friendly policies and uh, I don't know on how much we'll be able to do but uh, will continue as much as we can. So there are two sort of large questions uh, which we haven't addressed and frankly speaking we don't know how to address and this is why we haven't addressed them. Uh, so one large question is what determines salient divisions in so society uh, so as to generate these uh, identity groups. In principle, you can have many, but in, in practice, it appears that there are relatively a few that are salient. And it's quite clear that politics has some influence on which groups become salient and which become uh, less salient. So uh, this question of which group are salient or what, or what, what are the characteristics of salient group, this is actually quite difficult to deal with. Uh, and uh, there are some uh, discussions in, in psychology. Uh, so there is, for example, what's known as moral foundation theory, which has some a bearing on these issues, but it's not clear exactly how uh, this comes about. And the other big question uh, which is a, a sort of immediate question for this line of work is what are the mechanisms that politicians can uh, use or do use effectively in order to influence these shifts in uh, identification? This is also uh, not very clear. So for example, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Benjamin Enke, has written a beautiful paper using actually a questionnaire from this moral uh, foundation theory uh, in which he could distinguish different uh, patterns of voting 
based on uh, what's known as communal morality versus uh, generalized morality. And uh, basically what he argues is that uh, most Republicans adhere to some form of communal morality and Democrats for the most part adhere to universal morality. So I, I don't know how to use this, yes, and it's also one particular study. But the point is that there is a lot of exciting work that can be done here. And uh, there are people here who have to write dissertations, others who have to write papers. So <laughs> you have your marching orders. Thank you very much.